today, we'll go ahead and keep working on trigonometric equations. So we'll talk about um, a couple of other ways of solving these, mainly equations with half angles, equations with multiple angles. Mostly when we talk about that, uh, what we're going to be looking at, we'll do a lot of the same stuff that we were doing, uh, but we also wanna make sure that we establish the correct interval and we find all of the possible answers that we're supposed to find uh, when we deal with that, all right? So the first question, the first example that we'll talk about, something that's going to involve a half angle. I have two sine of x over two is equal to one. Now I wanna solve that for x over the interval from zero to two pi first, and then find all the solutions. All right? No, two pi is not included in this case. Zero is kind of like with most of our other ones. <coughs> much like we did before since i just have that one sign term and it's just a, a linear term it's not being squared or anything like that uh, i'm going to try to isolate that term the fact that it's x over two as the angle um, isn't important in terms of at least solving that part right now but it is going to affect what interval and the number of solutions that we're going to end up with here so first thing we're going to do is look at that angle <clears throat> if i know that x since we're talking about the interval from zero to two pi is the interval for x, then I wanna figure out what is gonna be the interval for x over two, all right? It's that angle that's given in the problem there. And that just means if I have zero is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to two pi, I'm gonna divide everything by two there to get that zero less than or equal to x over two less than pi, all right? So just divide, find that interval, write it as a, a and multiple inequality there, and then just divide everything to get to uh, the half angle that we started with, or that we're, we're dealing with in this case. So the, um, the properties of the zero to pi is that still gonna be the cosecant cotangent? No, the, the zero to pi just means that that's the only interval that we're gonna look for our answers on now, when we solve this. So when I take two sine of x over two equal to one and divide both sides by two, and get that sine of x over two is one half. I'm looking for the, the value, the angle of sine. Remember, just like we had before, like if I just had sine of x is equal to one half, I'm just trying to figure out what angle when I take the sine of it or what angles when I take sine of it gives me one half. I'm still looking for the same thing here. I'm looking for what angles when I take sine of it gives me one half. I just know that when I find those angles, those aren't going to be my values of x. They're going to be my values of x over 2. All right. So what values of x give me, or sorry, what angles give me a sign that's equal to 1 half? 30. 30 degrees or pi over 6 since it's in radians for the interval. And 3 pi over 6. The Five pi over six in the second quadrant. So reference angle of pi over six in the second quadrant. Important to note there that those are both between zero and pi. So I'm gonna have pi over six, five pi over six. Um, they're on the interval for my half angle for x over two. All right, the one that we just found at that first step. So half pi over six and five pi over six are the two answers for that value. Remember, those are not the values of X. All I was doing there is saying the two angles where sine is equal to one half, but the angle that we're talking about is X over two. So I'm gonna set X over two equal to pi over six. I'm gonna set X over two equal to five pi over six, and then solve for X by multiplying both sides by two. So pi over six times two is pi over three. Five pi over six times two is five pi over three. All right, make sure we're setting the angle inside of the trig function, inside of the sine function in this case, uh, <coughs> equal to the answers that we found, those angles that we found. So in this case, it's x over two is equal to the two values, the two angles that we found between zero and pi there. All right. 
So that's the solution set. Again, if we're talking about um, just the, the interval, the original interval from zero to two pi, and both of these answers are between zero and two pi, so pi over three, pi, pi over three, that comes from the fact that, again, when I multiply these by two, you know, I double those angles. And that's why we have the original interval that we were talking about before. I can always double check that just by plugging them back into the original, making sure it actually works as an equality, as an equation. If I want to find all the solutions here, have to look at this a little bit differently than what we were doing before. All right, because it's not just X that's inside of our trig function, inside of the sine function in this case. I have to be a little careful. Before, if we were looking for all solutions, I, was, I just added 360 degrees or two pi to everything because we're just going around um, one more time on the unit circle. So I'd have the pi over three plus two pi times in and the five pi over three plus two pi times in. I don't wanna do that in this case because that's not the period of my original function here. I have sine of x over two, the period of that function is not going to be two pi, right? The period is gonna be two pi divided by one half because sine of x over two is sine of one half times x. So my B value is equal to one half. So that means that the period of this function of the sine function that we're dealing with is four pi, not two pi, all right? There's a graph of what it looks like in a certain area. We can see the two values that we got, the pi over three, five pi over three. That's what those are. The most important part of this, again, is that the period of this function, the sine of X over two part is four pi. So if I'm going to find all the solutions, I'm gonna take that pi over three and then plus four pi times n, times some integer, any integer n, all right? And then the five pi over three plus four pi times n, all right? So make sure when we're not given uh, and just a, a normal trig function sine of x or cosine of x or anything like that, make sure if it's x over two or if it's two x or three x or something like that, that when we find all the solutions, not just over a particular interval, but all the solutions, that we add the correct period to find those other solutions and then multiply that period just by any integer n. So what does it mean by any integer? I mean, just any saying. integer. It means that n represents an infinite number. It's uh, one, two, three, four, all the way up to you know an infinite number and then zero, negative one, negative but, two, negative But to get the answer, we're gonna do like pi three plus four pi. That would be one other answer. And then another answer after that would be pi over three plus eight pi. So the and n then, holds the cost. Uh, yeah, n the is just okay. stands for every every possible integer value. Okay. All right. Biggest difference with this from what we were doing before, um, establishing a different interval from the the original one given, making sure we find our answers on that, and then the next one will be if we need to find all the solutions. And that's not always going to be the case, so this is why it's secondary. But if we need to find all the solutions, making sure we establish the correct period for the function that we're given, so that we add the right in it, we, we add the right value times that integer in to each answer. All right. Again, you can kind of ignore the graphing part. Don't worry necessarily about that. We found the solutions already algebraically. All right, so having said that, let's move on to a different example. Let's say I wanna solve cosine of two X equal to cosine of X over the interval from zero to two pi. Zero included, two pi not included, as per usual. In this case, can't really do anything the way that this is written because I have cosine of an angle 
and then equal to cosine of a different angle. I can't make those work together because 2x is not the same as x, all right? The only way that I could go about solving this would be if I got those to be cosine of the same angle, either rewrite the right-hand side in terms of cosine of 2x somehow, or as we'll do in this case, because it's, it's pretty simple, rewrite the left-hand side, the cosine of 2x part, uh, in terms of just cosine of x. So I know that cosine of 2x is a double angle. I know that I have a double angle identity for cosine of 2x, so that relates it to just cosine of x. So how can I rewrite cosine of 2x? What if cosine over cosine of x? Uh, no, I wouldn't be able to rewrite it as one half over cosine of, or one yeah, half of cosine. cosine. I need to rewrite it using the double angle identity. So what's, I mean, we, we have technically three double angle identities for cosine, but what's the one that uses just cosine of x? Cosine two x was equal to what? Two cosine squared x minus one. Two cosine squared x minus one. All right. So I'm going to rewrite it that way. And that way, again, at least what we know at that point is I'm dealing with just one particular term that I'm trying to solve for. All I'm trying to solve for is cosine of X. And I don't have two different terms, the cosine X, the cosine two X terms that I'm trying to, to solve for two different values. I, I can't really do that. I can only solve for the one so I'm going to rewrite it all in terms of just the cosine of X term. All right. But everything's in terms of just cosine of X. One of those terms is squared, all that good stuff. But now it's just a quadratic equation. We did one of these last time, right? I have two cosine squared X minus one is equal to cosine of X. I'm just treating the cosine of X as my U term. The, the term that I'm just looking at to solve for. So since it's quadratic, I'm going to make sure it's equal to zero. So subtract cosine of X from both sides. I'll have two cosine squared X minus cosine of X minus one or plus one. Oh, I think I messed this up. That should be minus one. Every time. I always miss one. I always miss something. That should be minus one there. All right. Um, this this part, the factored part's right. That should say two cosine squared X minus cosine of X minus one. I'll go back and fix that after. I already fixed three different things on this this morning. Still missed one. All right, but two cosine squared X minus cosine of X minus one factors into two cosine of X plus one times cosine of X minus one. That's again, that part's correct, but it's that's not what it would look like if that that equation was what we were using. That means cosine of X, or, or I've set each one of those equal to zero. So two cosine X plus one equals zero means cosine of X is negative one half. Cosine of X minus one equals zero means cosine of X is just equal to one. And then I need to find the values, the angles on the interval from zero to two pi, where cosine is negative one half and where cosine is one. So where is cosine equal to negative one half on, again, just the basic unit circle? Negative, so obviously second and third quadrants. Two pi zero is in pi Yeah, so my reference angle, since it's the reference angle is going to be dealing with finding a value of one half. I know it's negative, so I'm going to be in the second and third quadrant. The reference angle is going to be pi over three. So in the second quadrant, that means two pi over three. The third quadrant, that means four pi over three. And then where is cosine of x equal to one? Two pi over three. Uh, be equal to zero there. Yeah. Cosine is equal to one for what values? 
actually, I, I say values, but that's not really true. Yeah, it's just zero. Because at pi, it's negative one. And then at two pi, it would be one again, but two pi is not included. So just zero for that one. All right, so I get three answers there, three values of x. Two pi over three and four pi over three are when cosine is equal to negative one half. And then zero is the only value on the interval that we're given where cosine is equal to one. What did you say? When you, so you found it in the first quadrant and then just kind of, you found it on the three values then? For, for these? Yeah. Found it in the second and the third quadrant, yeah. yeah. So we know that, I mean, if I know that cosine is a positive one half at pi over three, then you I'm using that as a reference angle in the second quadrant and in the third yeah. quadrant. Yeah. You look, you have the three uh, denominator. Right. All right. That's our solution set, those three answers. And notice in this case, even though I did start with an answer, or sorry, with a, a term of cosine of 2x, I didn't have to worry about adjusting the interval or anything like that because I rewrote that cosine of 2x just in terms of cosine of x. And since x was defined on 0 to 2 pi, those are the only answers I needed to look for here. All right. But use an identity if we can just to rewrite everything in terms of the same, I, I say variable, that's a little iffy, but the same term. So also recognize cosine of 2x and cosine of x are not the same term. I have to have just cosine of x. It's the only way. I can square it, I can cube it, but it's gotta be cosine of x squared, cosine of x cubed, not cosine of 2x. All right. <clears throat> then let's say I want to solve for sine theta cosine theta equal to square root of three on the interval from zero to 360 degrees. So working with angles and degrees at this point. This one, again, I'm going to have to really recognize some of the identities that we've seen before and recognize them in a, a kind of the opposite way of, of the way we used them a lot. But just like with the previous problem, I had a double angle for cosine. I rewrote that uh, using one of the identities. I can't really do anything the way this is right now. Again, I have those two different terms. I have the, the sine theta term and the cosine theta term. Not really any way I can, I can figure anything out from there. If I subtracted the square root of three from both sides and had it equal to zero, I mean, I can't factor it. There's nothing that's gonna factor out of both terms. Um, I can't really divide by a sine theta or a cosine theta to solve for one. It's not gonna make it any easier on us. So what I'm gonna have to recognize here, again, as we would typically like to do, try to turn this into something that just has a single trig function as its term, all right? Just one, just like we did in the previous one, I turned everything into a single trig function for cosine of x. Again, it was squared and times two there for one of them, but it's all still in terms of cosine of x. So for this one, I'm gonna have to rewrite it and I'm gonna have to recognize that this actually does, it. when I look at the left-hand side, I can rewrite that using a double angle identity, right? If I write four sine theta cosine theta as two times two sine theta cosine theta, all right? And that sine theta times cosine theta should be a big hint in this case anyways. That was the, the form when I multiply that by two like we have here, that was the form for what identity? Two sine theta cosine theta is equivalent to what? Sine double. Sine of two theta. It's the double angle for sine. All right. So I can just rewrite that if I if I take out that one that factor out that two value and just have two times and then all in parentheses the two sine theta cosine theta. That's the same as two times sine of two theta. All right. And that's great because again, now I'm down to one term. I'm down to that one trig term. If I get that all by itself equal to some value, I can figure out what the angles are supposed to be. 
Now I'm going to have to adjust for the fact that it's a double angle in there and, and make sure we get the right answers based on that. But at least I can just solve for the sine term by itself. I can divide both sides by two and get that sine of two theta is equal to square root of three over two, right? Now I know where those values uh, if I'm just on the interval from 0 to 360 degrees, where would sine be equal to square root of 3 over 2? 3 pi over 3? Uh, pi over 3, so in this case, since it's in degrees, it would be 60 degrees, and... Uh, it would be the 60, 180, 40. So, uh, minus, it would be in the second quadrant. Yeah. So 60 and 120, yeah, 180 minus 60 in that case. So it'd be 60 and 120 degrees. However, those aren't going to be the only two answers that we're going to add to this one. Since my angle inside of the sine term is 2 theta, I'm going to do just what we did in the first problem. I, I know that that 0 to 360 degrees that's given up there is the interval for theta, right? So that means the interval for 2 theta I'm just going to multiply everything in this inequality by two. Two times zero is still zero, but that means zero degrees less than or equal to two theta less than 720 degrees. Right? So that means I need to find not just 60 degrees and 120 degrees, but the also the equivalent of those when I go around another time because zero to 720 would be two times around the unit circle. So I'm gonna have the 60 and the 120, but I'm also gonna add 360 degrees to the first one, add 360 degrees to the second one. And I'm gonna end up with four angles now, 60, 120, 420, 480 degrees. All right, and these are, again, these are just coterminal with the first two that we found but I do have to recognize that I'm not on the original interval anymore because we changed the angle that's inside of the sine function. I'm also going to have to change the interval over which that answer is going to be valid. So all four of those are answers for sine of two theta equal to square root of three over two. <clears throat> and now remember that doesn't solve for theta that just, that's just where is this equal to square root of 3 over 2? Well, that's where 2 theta is going to be those angles. All right, so then I have to divide everything by 2. It means theta is equal to 30 degrees and 60 degrees, and then also 210 degrees and 240 degrees. And that should make sense when we look at this as a, a final answer that we're going to have. When I've actually solved for theta all by itself, all of my answers are now where? Between zero and 360 degrees, that original interval that we were talking about. All right, which is great, that's how it should be. But once I solve for theta and found all those, plug in, I get this part, all right? And again, always go back and check, plug those values for that solution set into the original function and make sure they all work. I plug in 30 degrees. Sine of 30 is one half, cosine of 30 squared to three over two. So four times one half times square root of three over two is, well, it's gonna be square root of three, four square root of three over four, or square root of three. So wouldn't the 240 wouldn't be a negative? Or no, it's not negative because it, but, so we're looking, so since we found it in the double angle at 420, it's positive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Is that right? Am I thinking about it right? Yes. The third quadrant is negative. The sign is negative. Third quadrant sign is negative, yeah. So how did it end up positive? So what we're looking at here, if I'm looking at 30 and let's say if I'm plugging these back in, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 210 degrees is sine would be negative there, but cosine would also be negative if I look okay. at the first one. Okay, okay. Cosine is also negative. So I'm going to have um, you know, a negative one half times negative square root of three over two, and they're going to cancel out. And same goes since this is in the third quadrant. Okay. Be negative. So yeah, again, always a good idea to check and make sure that's true, because there is a chance when we start moving stuff around that we create answers 
that aren't actually valid answers in the original, things like that. Um, always go back and plug in, at least make sure that they make sense where they're at. <clears throat> All right. Questions so far? Last couple of these is, are, are really, you know, using double angle identities, but using identities to rewrite an equation, make it simpler for us to solve. Don't forget to adjust the interval. That's probably the main takeaway from this entire thing. Don't forget to adjust the interval if whatever's inside of the trig function is not just theta or just x. All right. Moving on. If I want to find all the solutions for that same equation, you know, we already know what the answers are on 0 to, to 2 pi or 0 to 360 degrees. All I want to make sure of is that I'm going to add the right values along the way. I'm going to make sure that I, I increase by the right integer times the, the correct period of the function that we're dealing with. So since all of the two theta solutions, all right, all the angles of two theta that are solutions of the equation I add 360 to those, right? So that means the 60 degrees, the 120 degrees, the other ones, all the other ones that I would get. Um, I'm going to add 360 degrees times n, right? That's the period of sine or cosine, in this case, both of them. But that's equal to 2 theta, right? We're not dealing with just the angle theta that I have there. So if I solve for theta, that means I'm going to have 30 degrees, I divide everything by two, uh, 30 degrees plus 180 degrees times in, I'll have 120 divided by two is 60 degrees plus 180 degrees times in. And notice when I look at these, these answers actually account for the other two answers I have. Remember, we had four answers here that I was given, and they only show, you know, the first two, the 60 degrees, 120, where I divide by two, I get 30 plus 180. Well, that's because 30 plus 180 degrees, the first time I go or go halfway around, I end up with 210. And 60 plus 180 degrees gives me this 240. So those two answers are accounted for when we do this. All right. And that's our, our solution set is just going to be those two values. I don't have to worry about writing it out four times because we're already accounting for the other two that we found. Okay. The other way of doing this would be to recognize that the period for just two theta, sine of two theta, would be what? Like instead of rewriting it this way and going, this is just another way of going about it. But if I looked at it in the same way that I looked at that very first problem where we have the sine of x over two, Sine of 2 theta has a period of what? It'd just be 360 degrees divided by 2, since b is 2. So sine of 2 theta has a period of 180 degrees. So I'm just going to take those solutions that we found before, the 30, the 60, the 210, 240, add 180 times in, because that's the, that is the period that we're going to have for each of those. And then I would just have to note, well, if I, if I add 180 to this one, I get 210, so I don't need that one again. I don't need to rewrite it twice. And if I add 180 to, to 60 degrees, I get 240, I don't need to add it twice. But that 180 degrees that we have there, that we're multiplying by this integer n, comes from the facts, again, just like the very first example, we solve for the period of the trig function that we're using. In this case, the sine of two theta function <clears throat> by taking, you know, 360 degrees divided by B. In this case, that's two. And I get that the new period for it is 180 degrees. All right. Questions on that? Careful with that. All right. Then, next example, let's say 
I want to solve tangent of 3x plus secant of 3x equal to 2 on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. 0 included, 2 pi not included, again, as usual. <coughs> this one a bit tougher. Obviously, I can't rewrite any either of those um, in terms of the other one just the way that they are right now because I, I only have tangent of 3x and secant of 3x. They're not squared, so I can't rewrite them that way. Can't do a whole lot of other stuff with that. I'm not going to be able to solve the way it is. I can't factor them out the way they're written right now, obviously, either, because they're two different trig functions. So what I'm going to have to do is remember that I want to try to get everything in terms of the same trig function, if at all possible, all right? In this case, there is a relationship between tangent and secant. We have an identity that relates the two of them, all right? Um, but not just tangent of something or just secant of something. I have to do what to them first. Or, or let me just rephrase that as what is the identity that relates tangent and secant together? Just the Pythagorean? The Pythagorean identity. And the Pythagorean identity for those is what? Tangent squared x plus 1 is secant. There we go. Tangent squared x plus 1 is equal to secant squared of x. So I'm going to try to use that, but remember that means they're both squared. I'm going to have to end up with some squared terms here in order to make this work. So to do that, if I want to, let's say I want to write everything in terms of secant instead of tangent. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with the tangent 3x plus secant 3x equal to 2. I want to square those terms. Remember, I can't just square everything individually. If I if I were to take this equation, I could square both sides. So I could square tangent of 3x plus secant of 3x. That means I'm multiplying it by itself. I'd have to FOIL it out. I would end up with a tangent squared term and a secant squared term. But I'd also have a term in the middle there that's 2 tangent 3x secant 3x. That's not going to help me because I can't rewrite that one. So the best thing to do here is to actually move the terms um, to different sides. Whichever way you want to do this, you can either subtract the tangent of 3x term or like this one, you could subtract the, three, the secant of 3x term from both sides. You get tangent 3x equal to 2 minus secant of 3x. And then I can go ahead and square both sides because I'm not going to end up with, you know, a, a tangent times a secant term in the middle when I FOIL everything out. I do still have to FOIL this right-hand side, but if I square the right, the left-hand side, it's just tangent squared of 3x. If I square the right-hand side, it's 2 minus secant of 3x, the quantity squared. So 2 minus secant of 3x times 2 minus secant of 3x. First term gives me 4 minus, the inside terms would be a minus 2 secant of 3x, and then the outside terms would be minus 2 secant of 3x, and then the last term would be a plus secant squared of 3x. All right, so when I actually multiply that out, take that term in parentheses times itself, FOIL out all those terms, I get 4 minus 4 secant of 3x plus secant squared of 3x. <coughs> Right. Seems like we've made this a lot more complicated than it started as, and technically, yes, we have. But by making it a bit more complicated, I've also made it so that I can do what with the left-hand side now. Tangent squared of 3x would be equivalent to It's kind of a different way of, of writing the identity. Other way. Secant minus one. It'd be secant squared of 3x minus one. All right. Since the identity, remember, is typically written as tangent squared of theta plus one is equal to secant squared of theta. If I want to know what tangent squared is by itself, I subtract one from both sides. So tangent squared theta is secant squared of theta minus one.
tangent squared of 3x is secant squared of 3x minus 1. Right? And that's great. I, I only have one variable term here. Right? It's written in a bunch of different forms, but my only variable term is secant of 3x. Here it's being squared. Here it's being multiplied by 4. Here it's also being squared. But it's all the same term. Right? It would just be like if I had x squared minus 1 equals 4 minus 4x plus x squared. I could solve that. Right? Same idea. It just looks a little more complicated. We're still solving for that one secant of 3x term. And notice since I have secant squared on both sides, I can subtract it from both sides. It'll just cancel out. So that's nice. I'm not even dealing with the squared term anymore. I can add one to both sides to get five here. I can add the four secant of 3x to both sides so that it's positive. So when I subtract those squared terms from both sides and cancel them out, when I add one to both sides of the equation, when I add 4 secant of 3x to both sides of the equation, I get that 4 secant of 3x is equal to 5. Right? So just a simplified version. It's just, again, very straightforward and linear in this case. And from there, I'm going to go about solving this. So the next thing I would do is what? Divide by four. Yeah, divide by four. I'm always going to try to isolate that trig function. Whatever it happens to be and whatever the angle inside of it is, always try to isolate that trig function if we're dealing with um, a linear term. Again, it's not squared. It's not quadratic. <clears throat> so divide by four, again, secant of 3x is 5 fourths. We could try to deal with that the way it is now, but we can make this a lot easier on ourselves and a lot more familiar. Um, and, and even since we're going to have to, a lot easier to plug into the calculator. If I just remember that secant of 3x is the same as 1 over cosine of 3x. And so if I rewrite secant of 3x as 1 over cosine of 3x and then take the reciprocal of both sides, that means cosine of 3x is going to be equal to 4 over 5. Not 5 fourths, but 4 over 5 in that case. Right? So rewrite the secant term in terms of cosine. Take the reciprocal of both sides. Take 1 divided by each side. Or if you prefer, you can just cross multiply, really. We end up with cosine of 3x equal to 4 fifths. Right? not one of our special trig values. There's, there wasn't a particular angle that gave us four fifths. I mean, we had one half and square root of two over two and square root of three over two, really all we could get out of those. So I'm gonna have to use a calculator to come up with these approximate values. Remember, dealing with cosine of three X here, if I go back to the original, my original interval was from zero to two pi. So really, when I solve this, I'm going to want every answer on the interval from zero to what? If I'm dealing with 3x, uh, yeah, it'd be 6, 5, yeah, since we're dealing in, in, uh, in radians. But yeah. So I'm going to do basically the same thing we did before. Again, 0 is less than or equal to x is less than 2 pi. Um, multiply everything by 3. 3 times 0 is 0 still. 3 times x is 3x. 3 times 2 pi is 6 pi. So that's the interval that I'm going to be dealing with here. I want to find every answer on the interval from 0 to 6 pi because that's what um, is going to solve our original equation. Right. And again, I don't I don't have a I can't just, you know, think about the unit circle, figure out those values. I'm going to have to just take the inverse cosine of four fifths. So a couple things about what this is going to be written out here next. If I just take inverse cosine of four fifths, all the calculator is going to give me is one single answer. Right. It's going to give me an answer that is where. 
since since it's a positive value there. If I take inverse cosine of that, it's going to be in the first quadrant. All right, and that's the only answer that the, the calculator can give us. If I take inverse cosine of four fifths, it will give me one answer that's in the first quadrant. All right. I also know that cosine is positive and is therefore there should be a corresponding angle. Whatever that angle is in the first quadrant, there should be a corresponding angle in the fourth quadrant. So how would I find that one? Again, I'm not even worried about zero to six pi yet. I'm just worried about zero to two pi. How would I get this corresponding angle in the fourth quadrant if I know the angle in the first quadrant? If let's just say that angle in the first quadrant is 0.5 radians. Subtracted from not 360 in this case, but zero. And uh, well, you're on the right track with 360, but we're not using degrees. So subtract it from two pi. Two pi. Okay. All right. That would give me again the angle in the first quadrant, the angle in the fourth quadrant. So that's where these are going to come from. This first answer here, this 0.6435, that is literally just taking inverse cosine of four fifths. That's what the calculator will tell you that is. It's not going to give you the rest of these, right? To find the rest of these, this one, remember, is the other answer that's still between zero and two pi, just one time around. I'm going to take 2 pi minus this to get this answer, all right? And that gives us the familiar, okay, my answer in the first and fourth quadrant, that's what we're dealing with. It doesn't look like a nice answer, but still, first and fourth quadrant answers, all right? To get the rest of these is much simpler to deal with. Since I'm going from zero to six pi, that just means I'm going around three times total. So this answer is just the one in the first quadrant, the coterminal angle in the first quadrant. I'm just gonna add two pi to this, All right? I'm gonna get this one in the fourth quadrant that's coterminal, I add two pi to this one. And to get this coterminal angle in the first quadrant again, I just add another two pi to that one. To get this coterminal angle in the fourth quadrant, I just add another two pi to that one, all right? So after I find those first two, again, important to recognize where these come from. Inverse cosine of four fifths on the calculator, two pi minus this answer on the calculator gives me the original, I say the original two answers, the two that we normally expect if we're talking zero to two pi. And then after that, just add two pi to those answers and then add two pi again, because you know we're on zero to six pi. All right, so be clear on that, make sure we know where those come from. And then again, we have to remember, I wasn't just taking cosine of X is equal to four fifths, I was taking cosine of three X. So all of those answers are equal to three X, or at least approximately, since we're kind of rounding off there. So then I have to divide all of them by three. All right, divide all six of those answers by three <coughs> to get an approximate value, or six approximate values for X. That solves for X. Um, and the good thing about all six of these values that I've solved for with X is that they are where? Between zero and two pi, remember our original interval. And that's what we end up with. All of these are between zero and two pi because two times 3.14 is gonna be a little more than 6.087 or 0687 or whatever it is, all right? lot to that problem makes sense up to that point because guess what it's not over we're not done yet don't forget just like with last time i started with the tangent of 3x plus secant of 3x equals 2. at some point along the way i squared both sides we did an example like that last time we have to go back once we find these answers, if I square both sides or cube both sides or whatever, there is a chance, probably a pretty good chance, that I've created extra answers out of thin air in order to try to solve this. So now I have to check all of these, 
right? See which ones are valid. They might all work. They might not all work, but I have to check all of them. Plug each one, again, back into the original function that we can find. Probably best to, you know, figure out which way I want this to go, but I can just plug into tangent of three times whatever plus secant of three times whatever. See if it comes out to two. All right. So when I do that, take each of these six answers. If I take the first one, the point two one four five, and plug it in, I get 1.999. We approximated our answer, so this is going to be approximate, but that's about equal to two. So we're going to go ahead and assume that if we didn't round off, that would give me the right answer. If I plug in the second one, the 1.8799 that was given there, I get one half essentially. So that one's not going to work. That second answer here isn't valid. When I plug it in, it doesn't make the equation that we started with true. All right, and then plug in the third one and the fourth one. The third one gives me two, about because we're approximating, the fourth one gives me a half again. The fifth one gives me two, the sixth one gives me a half. All right, so only those first, third, and fifth answers that we found, when I plug them back into the equation, are actually valid answers. Don't forget to do that if ever we, we square or really raise both sides of an equation to any power, but we're typically going to square it because that's what all our Pythagorean identities deal with. All right. Questions on that? Kind of involved. And again, we have to make sure we're always paying attention to where these answers are coming from and where they're supposed to be in terms of an interval. Uh, what they're supposed to be based on the original equation. Always plug back into the original equation and check. Good deal. Any questions? The last thing on here is an application, but it's it's just plugging in. It talks about fundamental frequencies. It, it's, it's just going to ask a question about plugging into this value. I'm not terribly worried about that. All right, it won't be anything that's weird. If you want to look over it, see what it talks about, that's cool. If you won't see anything like it on the homework or the test. All right. Any questions over solving trigonometric equations? Either from last time, which we did, or this time, which is kind of an expansion on that, with double and half angles. I will post some homework problems over this that will be due when? Monday. Not quite. Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday, because yeah, yeah, Monday's a holiday. Day after Easter's a holiday. So yeah, we don't have class. So we don't have class Monday. So I'll see you guys again Wednesday, which is when these will be due. And we will actually finish up chapter six that day because 6.4 is the last section.